Lately I've been thinking about my journey with the Lord and how He's brought me through from time to time. There aren't many miles ahead till I see Him face to face. And what I'll say has been running through my mind. Lord, you've been so good to me on my journey here below. You help me through each test along the road. And I hope that you don't mind if I sit here near your throne and praise you while the endless ages roll. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. You have been so good to me. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Throughout all eternity, and I hope that you don't mind if I sit here near your throne and praise you while the endless ages roll. It will be good to see the loved ones who've gone before and we'll talk of how his grace has brought us through but the one I long to see is the one who died for me and I'll thank him for his death at Calvary so good to me. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Throughout all eternity. And I hope that you don't mind if I sit here near your throne. And praise you while the endless ages roll. And I'll praise you while the endless ages roll. Thank God for that good song. Brother Arthur, you have been such a blessing to us all the years you've been here. And Sunday school yesterday morning and Sunday morning service and last night. Really tremendous messages. And then at high school chapel this morning, college chapel, now tonight our closing message with him. I appreciate you so much. You come and preach God's word, my dear brother. Thank you, Pastor. It's been a privilege for me to be here again. I love your pastor. I love your church. I love the college. I love the atmosphere. I like your pews. I like your piano. I like everything. And I appreciate the goodness of the Lord. And I do appreciate your pastor allowing us to leave at the end of the service. One of our faithful members went home to be with the Lord, and they've got that fuel tomorrow at 2 o'clock. And so we'll fly on the Red Eye flight, stay up all night long. I guarantee you I'll sit beside a dog or a crying baby, I guarantee <laughs> And go home and get an hour's nap and go preach that funeral. Sleep is overrated anyway. And uh, so I trust you'll pray for us. The hand of the Lord would be upon us. I think it's comical when somebody takes you to the airport and says, now be careful. I don't have anything to do with that. I hope the pilot will be careful. But Pastor Treber, I love you, my friend. And I thank the Lord for you. And as bold Brother Billy Kelly used to say, we've been friends down here and we will be friends up there. The book of Ezekiel, chapter number 14. 
verse 14 and verse number 20. And we'll read that verse again tonight and then we'll turn to the book of Job in just a moment. It is refreshing to be able to go to a church and still be able to understand the songs of Zion. I love that. And I have preached with a lot of the singing groups and the soloists across the country and I've been honored to do that. But I'm gonna put on my website and on my resume that in Santa Clara, California, I got to do a meeting with Alvin and the Chipmunks. That's, <laughs> that, that really blessed my heart, amen. And I love Brother Alvin. He's the kind of guy you can pick at and he doesn't get mad, at least not to me. He may get mad to somebody else, but I just love him. And I'm glad God's people can have a good time. In fact, turn to, my, turn, turn to somebody in your right and say, Jesus loves you. Now turn back around and say, boy, I wish I did. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the book of Ezekiel tonight, chapter number 14 and verse 14, said with me, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. And again, for double emphasis, he says it again in verse number 20, though, said with me, Noah, Daniel and Job were in it. As I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they shall deliver their own souls. How? By their righteousness. And again, the prophet Ezekiel is painting a picture of the day and the hour in which he lived. And a moral, political, religious darkness had swept over the land. And because of their rebellion, because of the apostasy, the judgment of God was going to fall on the days in the land of Ezekiel. But in the midst of that dark, bleak background, he says that we can live a righteous life in the midst of an unrighteous world. And aren't you glad tonight in a world of darkness we can live the light of life? In a world filled with apostasy and deception, we can walk in the way and the truth and the light. And even though it's an unrighteous world, we can live a righteous life. I'm glad we can rise above the scum, the shadows, the sin, the sorrows of our day and live for God. And he not only tells us we can do that, but he shows us by example. And he goes and he gets three different men from three different dispensations and reminds us that they live for God in their day. And we can live for God in our day. Because Noah's God was Daniel's God and Daniel's God was Job's God and Job's God is our God. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Remember, these three men had three things in common. Number one, they all live for God in a difficult time. Number two, they all possess the attribute of righteousness. And number three, they all experience divine deliverance from God. Not only deliverance from their present circumstances, but deliverance from a judgment that fell on their society. Noah, Daniel, and Job. Remember Sunday morning we looked at Noah. He is a picture of a Christian in a Christless world. But yet in that Andalusian society filled with sin, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And aren't you glad the church in this world of sin and sorrow can still find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Last night we looked at Brother Daniel. He is a picture of a Christian in a compromising world. But yet in a world of compromise, Daniel purposed in his heart that he keep on living for God. And aren't you glad tonight we can purpose in our heart that we're going to live for God no matter what others may do. I want to come tonight to the third man mentioned in our text, a man we all are familiar with by the name of Job. And if Noah was a Christian in a Christless world and Daniel was a Christian in a compromising world, 
then I believe Noah is a picture of a Christian in a chaotic world. Noah, a Job's world fell apart and crumbled all around him. But yet when the smoke cleared and the last shot was fired, Job had more in the end than he had in the beginning. And aren't you glad tonight? When your world falls apart and all your dreams lay in shambles and it seems like the storm has ravaged your life, aren't you glad tonight standing somewhere in the shadows you'll find Jesus. For Noah did a work for God in a Christless world. Daniel was a witness for God in a compromising world. But tonight, Job was a winner for God in a chaotic world. I'm glad he won the victory. He won the battle. He did more than survive the storm. He came through better than he was. I want to read about it tonight in the book of Job tonight. I want to read just a couple of verses. And I got three words I want you to write down as we read these verses tonight. I feel a shout coming on. Look in Job chapter number one and verse number five. And it was so that when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sinned and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And say this with me tonight, thus Job did continually. Beside of that verse tonight, I want you to write down the word before. Before. What was Job doing before the storm ever came? He was living for God and building an altar for God before. Now I want you to come to Job chapter number 23. In the middle of Job's calamity, look in Job chapter number 23. And look at verse 11 and verse number 12. Job 23, verse 11, my foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Beside of that verse tonight, I want you to write down the word beneath, beneath. What was Job doing beneath all of the pressure, beneath all the storm, beneath all the pressure? He was still living for God. He was still at the altar of God. He was still doing right by God. What Job did before the storm, he was doing beneath the storm. I come to chapter number 42, the last chapter in the story of Job. And look at chapter number 42 tonight in verse number 10. And I'm gonna try to read this first part, not get bogged down, but I like this. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Aren't you glad tonight God can turn it around? Aren't you glad God can turn it around? No matter what the storm looks like and the tragedy looks like and the pressure looks like, aren't you glad God can turn it around? And the Lord turned the captivity of Job, watch this now, when he did what? When he prayed for his friends. And also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Beside of that verse tonight, I want you to write down the word beyond. Beyond, what was Job doing beyond the pressure, beyond the storm, beyond the tragedy? He was still praying. He was still living for God. He was still at an altar of worship. What Job was doing before the storm, he did beneath the storm, and he did before the storm. Before the problem ever came, he was living for God. Beneath all of that problems, he was still living for God. And beyond all of his trouble, he was still living for God. Before and beneath and beyond. You say, how can those things be? Because God was real 
before. God was real beneath. And God was still real beyond. God loved Job before. God loved Job beneath. And God loved Job beyond. God had Job's best interest in mind before. God had Job's best interest in mind beneath. God had Job's best interest in mind beyond. God was good to Job before, and God was good to Job beneath, and God was good to Job beyond. God was faithful to Job before, and God was faithful to Job beneath, and God was faithful to Job beyond. Job loved God before. Job loved God beneath. And Job loved God beyond. Job did right before. Job did right beneath. And Job was still doing right beyond. Job praised the Lord before. He praised the Lord beneath. And he praised the Lord beyond. Job was God's child before. Job was God's trial beneath. And Job was God's trial beyond. Job and God had a great relationship before. And Job and God had a great relationship beneath. And Job and God had a great relationship beyond. And I know you're not supposed to do this, but I'm about to enjoy my own preaching. Well, aren't you glad God is right before and God is right beneath and God is right beyond? Oh, be a Christian before, be a Christian beneath, and be a Christian beyond. Because before the trouble ever comes, God is still good. And beneath all that trouble, God is good. And way beyond all of that trouble, God will still be good. Let me give you three things that Job did in his life in a world that was filled with chaos. And I want you to see what he did before and beneath and beyond. Number one tonight, you know what he did? He worshiped God. Job worshiped God before and beneath and beyond. In chapter number two, Job's wife comes in from the funeral. She has buried her children and they have lost everything that they ever had worked for. I think what amazes me about the story of Job is he started out with everything, then lost everything, had nothing and ended up with more than everything. Lord have mercy. He started out with all, he lost all, and he finished with more than all. You say, how do you have all and lose all and wind up with more than all? Because standing somewhere in the shadows of your chaotic world is a God that said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And at the end of all of that chaos, Mrs. Job comes in and she's looking for Brother Job. And before I show you where she found him, let me brag a little bit on Job at where she did not find him. She did not find him down at the bars drinking his blues away. She did not find him in the gates of the city blaspheming and bad-mouthing God and whining and griping and grumbling. When she found Job in chapter number two, do you know where she finds him? The Bible said he is in the ashes. The Bible says that Job is sitting in the ashes and he rises from those ashes And the Bible said he falls down upon the ground and worships. And he said in the midst of his worship, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You say, well, Brother Joe, what is so significant about Joe being in the ashes? 
Well, guess what ashes are? Ashes is the leftover of a previous fall. If you see ashes, that means there's been a fire there. Well, if he is sitting in the ashes where a fire had been, where did the ashes and the fire come from? Well, I read it in the text in chapter one and verse number five that before the storm ever came, Job is over there building him an altar and burning sacrifices. And now when Job has lost it all and his health and his wealth and his family's gone and he doesn't know what to do and he doesn't know what to say and he doesn't know where to turn, he goes back to the ashes where he has met God before, where he has worshiped God before, where he has heard God before, and he's reaching down in the ashes and picking up yesterday's answered prayer and yesterday's met needs and yesterday's blessings. And he's saying something like this. I've met God here before. I've heard from God here before. God's got a hold of me here before. And I just believe that God is able to do it again. But aren't you glad in a world of chaos, we got a place where we can go and meet God and worship God and get a hold of God and God to get a hold of us and that place is the altar where we've met God before. I've heard people say this. I don't know what's wrong with some of the people in our church. They go to the altar every time we have service. I'm not worried about them who go to the altar every time we have service. I'm worried about them who hadn't been to the altar since Moby Dick was a minnow. Oh, let me ask you this. How many has ever ate at McDonald's more than once? How many has ever ate, oh, I got you here, in and out more than once? And I know I got you here. How many has ever had, whoop, I just felt something on this, a Krispy Kreme. And I don't have to say more than once because if you ever ate one, you will eat another. Well, they built one right down the street from our church and that's hard on a man that's trying to lose weight. Because you go by there and there's that red sign, hot now, hot now. And you know what that's saying? That saying in theology, it's the will of God from the foundation of the world to pull in here and get you a donut. I got a friend of mine, Brother Aaron Wilbur, he said him and his wife had been on a diet and he said they made up their mind they were not gonna pull into Krispy Kreme unless the light was on. <laughs> he said, so he noticed every time he went by, the light was on. He said, so had to make it more difficult. He said, we won't stop even if the light's on unless there's a place to park right in the front door. And he said, the night we went by and the light was on and after we circled the block 12 times, we found a place to park in the front door. Oh, you know why you go to McDonald's more than once? You know why you go to Cracker Barrel more? Well, I don't know if you got them out here or not. You know where you go to in and out more than once? Some of you guys would just like to go to the, to go to the kitchen one more time. But, but, the, but the reason why you go to those places to eat more than once, it filled a need. You like the groceries. It just satisfied you. And I'm glad there's people that has found an alternative. They don't take drugs. They don't get drunk. They don't go to the world. They don't move to Moab. They don't go to the hog pen. They don't go to Egypt. They go to God. And they get in that altar where they've met God before. Aren't you glad? In a world of chaos. And you don't know where to turn or what to do. Go to that altar and worship God. And give him the glory. Because he is worthy of our praise. Worship him before. Worship him beneath. And worship him beyond. He is worthy of our worship. Heard a man on the radio tonight preaching. He said, I'm gonna do an exposition on worship. And after about five minutes, it dawned on me, he didn't know anything about worship. He said, we need to pray for God to create a worshipful atmosphere. Can I tell you this tonight? 
If you wait for the atmosphere to get conducive to worship, you may never worship. Can I remind you the atmosphere in Job's life was not pleasant. It was not conducive. The atmosphere in Job's life, it reeked with pain, sorrow, disappointment, and loss. But listen to Brother Joe tonight. If you never hear anything else I'll ever preach to you, you get a hold of this tonight. The atmosphere does not produce worship. Worship changes the atmosphere. The atmosphere does not produce worship. Worship changes the atmosphere. We don't worship God according to the atmosphere. We worship God according to his attributes. We worship God because he's holy, because he's righteous, because he's sovereign, because he's eternal, because he's more than enough. And when you really worship God, you're just telling God from a broken heart and a contrite spirit how much he's worth. Because can I tell you tonight, before and beneath and beyond. He is worthy of our praise. Build an altar. Worship God. Give him the glory. He's a good God and he's been good to us. Oh, I had one of those Sundays, you know, when you didn't tweet about it. And you didn't call any of your buddies and ask them how their Sunday was because you want to forget the kind that you had. It was one of them days I just be honest with you, the whole thing stunk. The choir singing stunk, the offering stunk, the attendance stunk, and my preaching stunk. Got out in the car and said to Miss Arthur, boy, I was needing some encouragement, some sympathy, and let me tell every one of you young men right now, the only female in your life that I have sympathy for you is your mother. Boy, I got in that car and I was hitting around about how I didn't do good and how everything stunk and, and I want her to say, oh baby, you're the man. You're awesome. You're the man. And finally I said, well, how did I do? And she said, well, you want me to be honest? No. <laughs> I said, yes. She said, well, you do have better material. <laughs> I said, I'll call my mama and ask her how I did. And my mama wasn't even there. And she said, I done great. But it was one of them Sundays. Well, because of my schedule, I don't have time to sulk. So come Monday morning, I got to get up, get to that airport and go preach somewhere that night. Boy, I'm walking in that airport. I'm feeling lower than I have felt in a long time. We've been under a real load. Boy, I just moping around and, and I almost got my phone. A lot of people are jealous over my phone and my flip phone and, and you had to use it today and he absolutely loved it. And, and I almost picked up my phone, Brother Cooper, and called that pastor that I was going to preach for and just tell him, man, I'm not in any shape to help you. I'm lower than you are. I'm more discouraged than you are. I don't have anything in, in me to help you. I'm spent. I'm gone. But you don't do that. You just... Lick your wounds and you just go on and trust God. And well, I was, in, I was on Concourse A, right in front of gate number 21. And the Spirit of God said, Joe Arthur, practice what you preach. And I said, Lord, what do you mean? He said, well, boy, you've run all over this country and told everybody, lift your hands and praise the Lord, whether you feel like it or not. God is worthy, God is good, and just go ahead and praise him. Practice what you preach. I said, Lord, I will. You let me get up there to North Carolina where I'm preaching tonight, and Lord, I'm gonna praise you and give you the glory. God said, now. I said, Lord, did you not hear that announcement they've made seven times since I've been here? Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Report all suspicious looking people to your local authority. And can I just say this? They all look suspicious to me, especially the lady in pajamas and flip flops and curlers and her poodle dog in her lap. I said, Lord, they'll think I'm, he said, now. Praise me now. I said, all right. 
And Lord, if I get arrested, <laughs> it's your fault. And right out there on concourse A, right smack dab in front of gate number 21, I just started singing to the top of my voice. I've been to Calvary. I can say I've seen the Lord. I've been to Calvary. You want to stand in line all by yourself? Just start singing, I've been to Calvary at Concourse A and gate number 21. Boy, I got to that last line through the witness of his word. Each day at Calvary, what a thrill of love divine just to know that the Savior is mine. And that was a little lady selling some coffee right across the hallway. And I don't think she was a Baptist because Baptists don't act like that. But when I got to that line, I've been to Calvary. She threw a coffee cup up and she said, Hallelujah, I've been there too, son. Hallelujah, I've been there too. And she got to shouting and I got to singing and we had to hold airport to ourselves. I'm here to tell you tonight when the storms are coming and trouble's coming and you don't know what to say and you don't know what to do. You just clear you off a piece of real estate and say God's your great and God's your awesome and God's your holy and God's your worthy. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for keeping me. Thank you for loving me. There's no better time than right now to praise the Lord and worship God. He is worthy before and beneath and beyond the stone. He's worshiping God. Number two, chapter number 23, verse 11, the text that I read before, beneath and beyond, he's not only worshiping God, I love this, but he's walking with God. I love his personal testimony in the text tonight. Chapter 23, verse number 11, he said, my foot, hath held his steps. He said, his way have I not declined. I have not gone backward from the commandment of his lips. What in the world is Job saying? Let me put it in our day. He said, I'm still going to church. I'm still reading my Bible. I'm still paying my tithes. I'm still paying my tithes. Mm. I'm still paying my tithes. I hadn't preached on that all week. I need to say that. I'm still paying my tithes. I'm still going soul winning. I'm still running my bus route. I'm still teaching my Sunday school class. I'm still showing up in the choir. I'm still sitting there in that pew saying amen and pray, praying for my preacher. You say, why is that so important? Because this man of God sitting here and all these other preachers are sitting here can tell you person after person and family after family, they went to church for a while and they served God for a while and they were faithful for a while. But when the storm came and the trouble came and the disappointment came, it blew them out of the water and they threw away their Bible and they turned their back on God and they quit going to church. But Job said, you look up here at me, the wind is blown and the lightnings flash and the thunders roll, but look at my feet. They've held his steps. I'm still walking in his way. I have not declined. I have not gone back. Job said, I was a doing right before and I'll be doing right beneath. And the Lord helping me, I'll be doing right beyond. Can I say this tonight, whether you understand it or not, live for God. Walk with God. Do right. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't turn back. Don't let the storms of life make you bitter. Let them make you better. I'm telling you the world needs to see somebody that keeps on serving God when the going gets rough. Boy, one Sunday morning we had a whole row of first time visitors Man, a choir sang like angels. That was one of them tweeting Sundays. I preached like fork at lightning. Man, we gave the invitation and the whole family got up, came down to the altar, got right with the Lord, they said, and joined the church. Boy, mama came, daddy came, junior came, sissy came, grandma came, papa came, and four aunts and two uncles. Boy, they got up from my altar. They was crying. 
They was hugging one another's necks. They hugged mine and I didn't even know who they were. And boy, they got up praising the Lord. I guess that's what they called it. They shouted all across the front and they, they walked down the right aisle crying and praising the Lord and they went out in the foyer and lifted their hands and praised the Lord and went out in the parking lot praising the Lord and they were going down Walt Stevens Boulevard praising the Lord. And I want to tell you, them people got so much of God at our church that day, they ain't been back since. Dr. Treber, let me help you with something tonight. Let me psychologically help you just a minute. You just don't know. You're so awesome that some people can hear you preach three times a year and you give them all of God they can take. There are some people you can, they can hear you preach once a year and you give them all they take. And I'm sure there's been some, you were so awesome you preach one time and their whole lifetime and they got all of God they could get. And finally, after about a month, I didn't see them. I went to the office, I got that card and I said to my staff, I got this one, I got this one. Boy, I called that number, hello, hi ma'am, this is Pastor Arthur. And don't you love when they go, who? <laughs> Pastor Arthur from Harvest Baptist Tabernacle, Georgia, Georgia. Uh, where? And I lost it. I said, you know that church your family cried and shouted all over the place. The one you joined a little bit. Oh, you know you're in trouble when they say, oh, that one. Like it's numbered. I said, man, we've been missing you guys. We've been missing y'all. We've been missing you and just whatever you're supposed to say. I said, we've been missing you. And she said this. She said, pray for us, pastor. We're out of church. And I know I shouldn't have done this and a good pastor would have never done this. But I said to that lady, well, that didn't last long. And then she said what every pastor loves to hear, you just don't understand. And I'm thinking, try me. She said, we got issues. I said, you got what? She said, we got issues. I said, ma'am, I'm gonna say to you what Barney said to Andy and Mayberry. I got issues, you got issues, all of God's children got issues. I said, ma'am, here's what you do. I'll get my issues, you'll get your issues, and we'll go to church together, and we'll worship God together, and we'll pray together, and we'll go to the altar, and we'll lay down our issues, and get help from God, and encourage one another. Brother, when the storm comes, and the trouble comes, that's not when you quit church, that's not when you quit reading your Bible, that's not when you burn out on God. Hey, Hebrews 10, 25 says, exhorting one another, not less of, but so much the more, so much the more. Keep on doing right. Keep on walking with God. Stay in church. Read your Bible. Go with God. It's always right to do right before, beneath, and beyond. Job said, I had integrity before, and I've got integrity beneath, and I'll still have integrity beyond God had a record before, God's got a record beneath, and God has got a record beyond. That was a little song we used to sing back in the mountains. If you can sing when it seems there is nothing to sing about, then I'll know that you know the Savior. And if you can pray when everyone says there's no need of praying, then I'll know that you know the Savior. How many will agree with me tonight that any old dead fish can float downstream? Anybody can serve the Lord and be faithful when the kids aren't sick and the car starts and the roof doesn't leak and all the bills are paid. But it takes real faith and it takes real courage to serve the Lord when the car won't start and the roof is leaking and the bills are behind. Because can I tell you this? No matter what it looks like, no matter what it tastes like, no matter what it sounds like, no matter what it feels like, God is still great. God is still holy. God is still still good and he deserves better than that. Keep on walking with God. Amen. Don't turn your back on God when you need him the most. 
Pastor Treber, how many times as a pastor you've had people stop doing what they need the most when they need it the most. Had a man tell me one time, he said, Brother Joe, my wife's been unfaithful to me. And I said, I'm sorry, sir. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go be unfaithful to her. And like again, a good pastor wouldn't have said this, but the devil made me do it. I said, that's great, sir. What your children need are two dumb parents. Oh, I'm going to do it and get even with her. I said, sir, let me tell you something. Two wrongs never make a right. But someone's persecuted me and they say they are a Christian. Don't you worry about that. God knows you and God knows them. But Brother Joe, somebody's not done me right. You leave that with God and you keep on doing right. Oh, Job's friends laughed at him. They made fun of him. They called him a liar. They called him a scoundrel. They called him a cheat. But Job said, listen, it's not what you say about me. It's what God's already said to me. And let me encourage somebody in this room tonight Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Get your eyes off of everybody else. He'll never do you bad. He'll never do you wrong. He deserves better than your quitting and your bitterness and your bad mouthing and your backsliding. I say, stay with him. Stay with him. Don't you turn your back on the person you need the most when you need him the most. Don't you quit serving the God that can help you when nobody else can help you. What with God before? Walk with God beneath and walk with God beyond. He worshiped God. He walked with God. And number three, I love this. He waited on God. Chapter 15, verse 13, his friends finally get him to say something. Job, what are you going to do? You've lost your money. You've lost your finances. Your children have died. Your wife don't even believe in you. You're broken out with leprosy from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. Job, what are you going to do? In chapter 15, verse 13, Job makes this decision. He said, he says, though he slay me, and I love this big word in the Bible, yet, 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 yet will I trust in him. He said, I could trust God before. I can trust God beneath, and I'll still be trusting God beyond. I could lean on God before. I can lean on God beneath, and I can lean on God beyond. God did right by me before. God will do right by me beneath, and God will still be doing right by me beyond. Can I tell you tonight, even in the time of trouble and trial and difficulty, you can trust God and wait on God, for he is trustworthy. Job, what are you waiting on? He said, I'm waiting on God's person. Who is he, Job? He said, I know my Redeemer liveth. Job, what are you waiting on? I'm waiting on God's promise. I'm waiting on God's promise. Those skin worms destroy my body. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job, what are you waiting on? What are you trusting? I'm trusting in God's plan. What do you mean, Job? He said, God's got a plan. What is it, Job? He said, here is God's plan. Though he try me, and even though he does try me, I shall come forth as gold. I can trust that God's got a purpose, and God's got a plan, and he'll always do right. I can trust that God knows what he's doing in my life. Oh, I'm glad you can trust him tonight. Can I tell you something? God makes no mistakes. And it's easy to sing that. It's easy to preach that. But my family lately, we've had to live some of that. And can I just tell you, it's true 
It's true. It's true. You can trust in God's divine plan in your life. He said, I shall come forth as gold. And the more you burn gold, the more pure that it gets. And on the other side of Job's affliction, he didn't have less faith, he had more faith. On the other side of his storm, he wasn't less of a believer, he was more than a believer. On the other side of his storm, he wasn't further from God, he was closer to God because he trusted in a God that did not and will not and cannot fail us tonight. He worshiped God. He walked with God. And he waited on God. And the Bible said, and in the end, God turned his captivity. You know, it would be a shame to go through something like Job went through and not learn anything. Wouldn't that be a tragedy? To go through all that dear man went through and not learn anything from it. So I was reading the last chapter and I found out something in the life of Job. He learned some valuable lessons from this trial. What did he learn? Well, chapter 42, he makes two bold statements. First part of the chapter, he makes this statement. He said, Lord, I've heard about you with my ears. I've heard how wonderful you are and how faithful you are and how great you are. Lord, I, Lord, I have heard about thee with my hearing, but now my eye seeth thee. He said, Lord, I heard how great you were, but now I know how great you are. Lord, I heard how faithful you were, but now I know how faithful you are. God, I heard that you would never leave me nor forsake me, but now I know you've never left me nor forsaken me. God, I've heard about you, but now I see. And when I was trying to get over that, my eyes fell to the next verse and dynamite went off in my soul. And he makes this statement. Here's what he learned. He said, Lord, now I know that you can do everything. God, I've learned that you can do everything. And you know what we're going to learn before and beneath and beyond the storms? That God can do anything. Because there's not a problem that he cannot solve. There's not a storm that he cannot steal. There's not a burden that he cannot live. There's not a prayer that he cannot answer. There's not a need that he cannot meet. There's not a person that he cannot save. There's not a mountain that he cannot move. There's not an ocean that he cannot swim. God can do everything. On the other side of that storm, we know more about God than before we went into that storm. Because before and beneath and beyond, God is good and God is holy and God is right. I was sitting in a lonely motel room not long ago And I cried till I didn't have any more tears. I moaned and groaned till I had no more strength. And I just laid out there on the floor. All I could say was, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh Lord, oh Jesus, oh God. Help, Lord, please. Oh, God. You ever been there? And boy, I felt led to read my Bible in Romans chapter number eight. And all of a sudden, I got blessed. Because you know what Romans eight says? It says, when I don't know how to pray or for what I ought to pray for, the Spirit of God that is in me 
makes intercession to my heavenly Father because he knows the mind of God and he knows the unexpressible grief that is in my heart. Now God didn't speak to me in an audible voice. Have you ever noticed these preachers every time God speaks in an audible voice, he's always talking about airplanes and money. I didn't hear an audible voice. But that sweet peace that I've sang about, that sweet peace that I've preached about, I felt the sweet peace of God. And my heavenly father came to that little motel room. Boy, aren't you glad God knows where Motel 6 is? And whispered in my heart, son, I got it. And everything's going to be all right. What you preach to others is real. What you've told others to do works. I got this one. And everything's going to be all right. Growing up, I used to love to hear my mama say, everything's going to be all right. Every once in a while, daddy would say, everything's going to be all right. I've got a precious son and a wonderful daughter that'll tell me, dad, everything's going to be all right. Miss Arthur don't say that. She just says, oh, you'll be all right. Suck it up. Be a man. Tell your news. <laughs> There's been times I've had to call this man and he'll say, Brother Joe, it's going to be all right. And my friends will tell me it's going to be all right. And I got a bunch of loving church members that love me and they'll tell me, preacher, it's going to be all right. And I like it when mama says it's going to be all right. And I like it when daddy says it's going to be all right. And I like it when my friends say it's going to be all right. But can't nobody say it's going to be all right like he can say it's going to be all right because he's the only one that can make it all right. Before, beneath, and beyond. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know. Thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. He loves you tonight. You can trust him tonight before, beneath, and beyond the storms of life. Father, we love you tonight. And thank you, Lord, for writing about Noah, and thank you, Lord, for writing about Daniel. Lord, thank you for writing about Job. And I'm glad, Lord, you didn't fail them and you're not going to fail us. You didn't forsake them and you're not going to forsake us. They found you to be faithful, and so will we. And Lord, I pray for your people tonight that may be in a world of chaos and confusion and seem like there's more loss than gain. May you remind them tonight, Lord, you're good in the good time and you're still good in the hard time. Help us to trust you tonight. Lord, help us to keep our faith and our testimony to a world and say that God is still good. And Lord, when we see you in a place called heaven, we'll be glad that we live for you. Sanctify the word of God in our heart and we'll love you for it because we ask it in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you, Pastor. Let's stand together as we stand together. This altar is open tonight. If you're here to be saved, if you're here to say my life is God's to control, would you let someone pray with you? If you're surrendering your life to serve God, I'd have to think that God's going to speak to some of our lives about serving Him a lifetime. 
perhaps some mothers and dads ought to say, I'm coming to say, God, you can have my children. We have some parents here tonight, their son and daughter-in-law going to Guyana. God bless those dear mom and dad. How about it? be absorbed with thee may we not waste our life on social media and texting and talking we may we pray more than we talk on the media may we spread righteousness and godliness and holiness and not unkindness and hurt and wound Lord, there must be a revival in the house of God. There must be. And I pray that you would allow us to witness in our lifetime the sweet Holy Spirit of God speaking to our hearts and lives. I pray before this week is over, you'd allow some to give their sons and daughters to thee. And others that would Say, I am a son or a daughter. I want to go anywhere God wants me to go. Bless this great, great church. What a great crowd tonight. We thank you for our friends that have watched tonight. I pray that they would have been blessed like we have been blessed. To my dear brother, Lord, that has given his life to us as he flies through the night hours. Please give him safety. And he has arrives at that airport in Atlanta. May he get home, get ready for that funeral. Make him a blessing to the church. Bless our great service tomorrow night as we look forward to being together. If you should tarry, in Jesus' name, amen.